Hello and welcome to lecture 12 for the course ECE 252B Computer Arithmetic uh, Spring 2020. In this lecture we will cover chapter 14 in the textbook uh, dealing with high radix dividers. So the notion of high radix dividers should be familiar to you already because we discuss high radix multipliers in which multiple bits of the multiplier will process at once, two bits in radix 4, three bits in radix 8, and so on. And there are also other high radices besides, besides powers of two, power of two radices. For example, radix 10 has uh, recently become quite popular and people implement uh, decimal uh, arithmetic units, including decimal dividers. So, High radix division is characterized by this recurrence, which is very similar to the radix 2 division recurrence, except that the number 2 is replaced with R, the radix. So it's a shift, a repeated shift subtract uh, algorithm, where the previous partial remainder as j minus 1 is left shifted by one radix r digit and from this left shifted uh, partial remainder uh, the product of the next quotient digit and this pre-shifted divisor is subtracted to give us the next Ultra remainder. So this recurrence is identical to the radix 2 recurrence, with, except that you have R in, where you had 2 in that recurrence. Again, we start with the zeroth partial remainder being Z, the dividend, and the kth partial remainder at the end of the division process is basically a shifted version of the true remainder s and it's shifted by k bit k digit radix r digits to the left because of these left shifts there, there are k steps during each of which uh, a single digit shift takes place so that by the end of the process the remainder has been shifted by k digits we sometimes refer to this uh, remainder that is gradually gradually shifted as sca the scaled remainder. So the first remainder, zero remainder actually, is z. The first remainder after that is already scaled by r. The next one after that is scaled by r squared and so on until the final remainder is scaled by r to the k. So this is basically the starting point for our division process. z is left shifted by one digit. And the product of qk minus j times this rk times d is this number. Notice that this light green part was absent in the binary case because in the binary case this quotient digit is 0 or 1 so the width of this number is exactly the same as the width of the divisor in this case the width of this value that is being subtracted can be one digit more than the divisor Radices of practical interest are powers of 2, radix 4, radix 8, radix 16, and so on, and perhaps 10. So this is the, the 
dot notation representation of radix 4 division as you see the 4 bit quotient is derived 2 bits at a time or 1 radix 4 digit at a time so once we decide what the next radix 4 quotient digit is we multiply it by the divisor and this is the product it's one digit one radix four digit wider than the divisor then we decide on the next quotient digit in radix four multiplied by d okay so this is shifted to the left the first one is shifted to the left by one radix four digit because of the position of this digit and the next one is not shifted and then we subtract this one from z to get the first so this is the zeroth partial remainder z uh, when we subtract this first number which is the product of q3 q2 one radix four digit by d times four to the one we get the first partial remainder and then subtract this radix four digit times d times four to the zero no shift we get the second or final partial remainder so the division is done in two cycles rather than four cycles so it could be potentially twice as fast although now we have to worry about how to decide on what this radix four quotient digit is it's no longer as straightforward as in the binary case okay so here is basically an illustration of why quotient digit selection in nine non-binary cases can be difficult in binary remember I said that because the quotient digit is either zero or one we can just assume it's one do a trial subtraction and if it doesn't work out if it works out then one was the correct choice if it doesn't work out then zero is the correct choice in either case we have determined the next quotient digit or quotient bit in binary using one subtraction okay now here is a decimal division sorry sorry it's a let me see is this yeah it is a decimal uh, I find eight digit number by a four digit number so the quotient will be a four digit number okay in order to guess what the first quotient digit might be we might look at the part of the dividend and part of the divisor we see that the dividend starts with 12 the divisor starts with 2 therefore a reasonable guess would be that 6 is the first quotient digit okay or we may look at more digits let's say 122 at the beginning of the dividend and 20 at the beginning of the divisor again our estimate or guess for the quotient digit will be 6 122 divided by 20 is a little bit more than 6 look at still more digits 1225 divided by 204 still our guess would be 6 look a little bit further and you see that 1225 divided by the 2043 is 5. something so the correct quotient digit in this case is 5 not 6 and uh, we won't know that it's 5 unless we examine basically all the digits of the divisor and this is inconvenient we would like to be able to just look at a few digits 
of the two operands and guess what the quotient digit will be because a simple circuit that then can generate the quotient digit. So there's no simple solution to this. Basically, even the first quotient digit depends on all the digits of the operands. So in the worst case, all k digits of the divisor and k plus one digits in the partial remainder are needed to make a correct choice. So what's the solution? The solution is to use redundant sign digit representation of the quotient. So let's say we represent the quotient with the digit set that goes from negative 9 to 9. Okay, in this case, now the, the reason that the, with the non-redundant representation we run into trouble is that there's no margin for error. In other words, if I choose the quotient digit to be 6, I cannot recover from that error later on. I have to start with 5 to get the correct digits in subsequent steps. Okay. However, if I use redundant digits for the quotient, if I overestimate the quotient digit, so in this particular division, the quotient digit the correct first quotient digit is 5, and the second quotient digit is 9. Okay? So this wrong choice 6 is not disastrous because I can recover from that by choosing the next quotient digit to be negative. So I generate the quotient digit instead of 5, 9 for the first two digits, 6, negative 1. So 50 plus 9 versus 60 minus 1. So this redundancy in quotient digit, in the representation of the quotient, allows me some flexibility, allows me the ability to recover from a wrong estimate. And therefore, I can base my estimate just on a few digits of the two operands. So this is basically the key tool that we use, the key idea we use in order to make high radix division practical. We generate the quotient with redundant digits rather than standard or non-redundant digits. Okay, so let's look at uh, a couple of examples here. There's a radix 4 integer division on the left and the radix 10 fractional division. So I'm trying to illustrate both integer and fractional in different radices, 4 versus 10. So here's the number Z, 8-digit radix 4 number. Here is D, pre-multiplied by 4 to the 4. In other words, it's aligned with the upper half of the 0th partial remainder. So the 0th partial remainder, left shifted, multiplied by 4. And we subtract from it, again, we sort of assume in this beginning example that we magically know what the quotient digits are, 1, 0, 1, 2. So we want to make it easy and not worry about the selection of the quotient digit at this point. We just want to present the mechanics of the division. Okay, so the first quotient digit, let's say, is 1. So 1 times this 12 or 3 is written down here with one extra digit, and subtraction takes place. Then the second, uh, then left shifted. The second quotient digit is zero. You can see why, because if I try to subtract even 12 or three, which correspond to quotient digit equal to one, the result would go negative. So the correct quotient digit is zero, Subtract, shift left. The next quotient digit is 1. Subtract 1 times 12 or 3. This is the result of subtraction. Shift left. And finally, the last quotient digit is 2. 2 times, 
I read this 1203, but it's not really 1203. It's a 1203 in radix 4. 2 times that in radix 4 is 3012. Subtract. And then this is the remainder, which has been shifted by 4 digits. So this is the true remainder. And the quotient is 1012. Okay, and it's easy to verify that this is correct by just obtaining the decimal equivalent of the operands and the decimal equivalent of the quotient and remainder. And in the radix uh, 10 case, uh, 0.7003 is being divided by 0.99. Again, we somehow know that the quotient digit are 7 and 0. So 7 times 0.99 is 6.93. Subtract, left shift. 0 times 0.99 is 0. Subtract. And then right shift the remainder to get the true remainder. And the fractional quotient is 0.7 zero. Okay, so choosing the quotient digit to be in redu using redundancy in quotient digit is one technique. And then another speed up technique uh, for both high radix and radix two dividers is to use the uh, partial, uh, partial remainder that is represented in carry safe form. So let's first look at the radix 2 division speed up using carry safe partial remainders. And this is a diagram representing, uh, if you ignore this middle line here, that's non restoring division. Uh, quotient digits being 1 and negative 1. And if I allow also 0 as a possible quotient digit, then the choice of 1 is valid whenever the partial remainder is positive. Negative 1 is valid whenever the partial remainder is negative. And zero is valid whenever uh, the partial remainder is between the shifted partial remainder 2sj minus 1 is between negative d and d. Okay? Now, again, let's ignore this middle line for, for, for a minute. Now, in standard non restoring division, the choice of whether the quotient digit is 1 or negative 1 is based on the sign of the partial remainder. But if we keep the partial remainder in carry safe form, meaning two numbers, we can tell the sign because you know, each of the two components can be positive or negative. And unless we actually add them, we don't know whether the actual partial remainder is positive or negative. We don't want to add them. We want to keep them in carry safe form. Therefore, that's why we introduce the zero as an option. Because now there is an overlap between the values where one is the correct quotient digit and when zero is the correct quotient digit. And this overlap region, I'm allowed to choose zero or one and therefore, if I know the value of this shifted partial remainder approximately, so that, for example, I know it's in this neighborhood, okay? I don't know exactly what it is. I can still choose the correct quotient digit. So imagine that the approximation is such that I know that the shifted partial remainder is in this region the region that I'm circling. Now this region, some of it is less than D, some of it is greater than D. Therefore, zero cannot be chosen as the quotient digit. 
but one is a valid quotient digit for this entire range. Okay. Similarly, if the approximate value of the shifted partial remainder is in this neighborhood, I don't know the exact value, but I know it's roughly in this area. Okay. So despite this uncertainty, I know that zero would be a correct choice for the quotient digit, and so on. So these overlaps help. And in particular, I can say, OK, I'm going to set the two thresholds of 0 and negative 1 half to decide. So I use 0 as a threshold for deciding between 1 and 0. And I choose negative 1 half, this other dash line, as a threshold for choosing between 0 and negative 1. Okay, now if the error in my estimate of the partial remainder is up to one half, I'm still okay. Because if I say, okay, something is greater than this value, okay, so if it's one half greater, still zero would be the correct choice. So I have a margin of one half, similarly for this one. If I say something is greater than, sorry, if I say something is less than minus one half based on the approximate value, okay, even if it's plus one half greater than my estimate, negative one is still a valid choice. So here is what I can do with this additional flexibility or error tolerance in estimating the quotient digit. Okay, so let's say the uh, carry save partial remainder, the shifted partial remainder, has two components u and v. So we are dealing with fractional division. So in fractional division, we have one integer bit, which is basically the sine bit, and fractional bits. So we have sine bit. And then when we left shift it, we have two integer bits. After left shifting, this now becomes the sine bit. This is a magnitude bit, because we have doubled the value. And the rest of the bits are also magnitude bits. Similarly for the second component. Okay, so now imagine that I take just four bits of u. U can be pretty long. It can be you know, 64 bits long. But I just take four bits of u, u extending from bit negative 2 to 1, from position negative 2 to 1 and v extending from position negative 2 to 1, and add these two 4-bit numbers. Now, 4-bit numbers are you know, pretty short, so I can add them rather quickly. And let's call the result of this addition t. So t is the sum of 4 bits of u and 4 bits of v. If t is less than negative 1 half, so this threshold, OK, t is not the exact partial remainder. There is an error. How much error is there? Well, the error is due to dropping all these other bits. Now, this position is worth 1 half. This position is worth 1 fourth. All the other positions are worth collectively less than one, a little bit less than 1 fourth. So it's basically 1 8 plus 1 16 plus 1 32nd. Okay, so 1 fourth is an upper bound on the error I commit by ignoring all these bits. And 1 fourth is the upper bound of the error I commit by ignoring all these bits. So the total error is upper bounded by 1 half. 1 fourth plus 1 fourth. Therefore, when I say t is less than negative 1 half, 
the actual value of t can be up to one half more than what I see. Okay, the actual value of the partial remainder can be up to one half more than what I see in t, which is an approximation of the partial. Okay, but even if it's it's a little bit less than one half more. Even if the error, maximum error is considered, then still negative one is a correct choice for the quotient digit. So I choose negative one. Otherwise, if t is greater than or equal to zero, well, if t, which is the truncated version basically of the partial remainder, is greater than or equal to zero, then the partial remainder is definitely greater than or equal to zero because t is less than the actual partial remainder, okay? Therefore, 1 is the correct choice for the quotient digit. And then in other cases, I choose the quotient digit to be 0. So now, the choice of the quotient digit in radix 2 is dependent only on a few bits of the two components of the partial remainder, and I can easily design a logic circuit or use a small table to, from which I read the quotient digit. Okay, so the idea here is that the quotient is redundant because in radix two, it uses the digits negative one, zero, and one. It's a redundant representation. And that redundancy allows me to basically truncate the partial remainder, use an approximate version of the partial remainder to do my quotient digit selection decision. Okay, so this leads to this divider. Remember, I went back to radix two Okay, we sort of took a detour from high radix division to see how uh, a carry safe partial remainder can be used in radix 2. Then we'll see how it can be used in higher radices as well. So this is the carry safe partial remainder up here, the sum component and the carry component, which is left shifted. That's why it has one fewer bit at the right end. So this carry safe partial remainder, four bits of each component are examined by this quotient digit selection logic. And based on examining those eight bits, I have not shown the in internal design of the selection logic. A quotient digit is selected, which can be zero, one, or negative one. And these three values are encoded by two bits. One bit says whether the value is non-zero. So this, this bit is uh, asserted when the value is non-zero. And if it's non-zero, it can be positive one or negative one, and the sign is determined by this bit. If this is not enabled, in other words, the uh, the quotient digit is zero, the multiplexer is not enabled, and zero goes out. If it's enabled, then either the complement of the divisor goes out, if the sign is negative, and the divisor itself goes out if the sign is positive. If the complement goes out, we need to add a one to make that into two's complement. And that one can be inserted into this unused position of the carry component of the carry safe partial remain. Okay, so we put that carry in into this position. And therefore, we add these two k bit numbers to this k bit number and find the carry and sum, and these are fed back for the next cycle. 
So throughout the division process, we just do a query set. So the critical path of the circuit goes through the selection logic, this multiplexer, and then carry save add. So it can be pretty fast. This, this is maybe two, three logic levels. It's not, this is a couple of logic levels multiplexer. And carry save adder is two, three logic levels. So it's pretty quick. And then when we are done with all the iterations, then the carry and sum are put into a regular adder and the binary output is obtained. So this use of carry save partial remainder allows me to make the iterations much faster and do the carry propagate addition only once at the very end. Okay, let me skip this slide. So this is another representation of the process for radix 2 division with redundant digit set negative 1, 0, and 1. So this, this diagram on the right, top right, is repeated from a previous slide. So basically here we see the overlap regions. The overlap between the choice of 0 and 1 goes from 0 to D. For, so the shifted partial remainder being between 0 and D allows me two choices, two possible choices. And the shifted partial remainder going from negative D to 0 allows me two choices. And outside those regions, I have just one choice. And it is that overlap that allows me flexibility in using an approximate value for the partial remainder in guessing or estimating the quotient digit. OK, this diagram is another representation of the same thing. This is known um, in computer arithmetic literature as the PD plot. So P is basically the shifted partial remainder. So what we call 2SJ minus 1 in this previous diagram is now called P. So for, for historical reason, uh, I keep this P because you know this diagram is known as PD plot, and everywhere it's referred to as the PD plot. Could have called it the 2SJ minus 1 versus D. So this PD plot shows those same overlap regions in a different way. So remember I said the overlap region between quotient digit being 0 and 1 goes from 0 to D. Okay, so this is the overlap region. So 1 is a valid choice between 0 and 2D. Between 0 and 2D. So this line represents P equal to 2D. This line represents P equal to D. And this line is P equal to 0. So between 0 and 2D, 1 is a valid quotient digit. Between 0 and negative 2D, negative 1 in this region. Between 0 and negative 2D, negative 1 is a valid choice. And between negative D and D, 0 is a valid choice. Between negative D and D. So this diagram represents the same information as in this previous diagram. Now the overlap regions are areas in this 2D plot. So for example, the overlap between 0 and 1 is this region. The overlap between 0 and negative 1 is in this region. Now I've drawn two lines, the red ones here, one of which is in the overlap region between 0 and 1, and the other one is in the overlap region between 0 and negative 1. And use those, those lines, which are basically the same as the dotted lines in the previous diagram, as thresholds for making my decision. 
if the shifted partial remainder is greater than zero, choose one. If it's less than minus one half, choose negative one. If it's between minus one half and zero, choose zero. Okay, notice that the choice is independent of D because I was able to put straight lines, straight horizontal lines through the overlap regions. And therefore, the choice is independent of D. So for any particular value of D, when we do a particular division, D has a certain value. Let's say D has this value in a particular division. Okay, doesn't matter what the value of D is. Even if D is this value, the choice for the quotient digit will follow the same process. These shaded regions are infeasible regions because the shifted partial remainder can never be greater than 2D. And it can never be less than negative 2D because the original one was between negative d and d. Therefore, when we shift it, it will remain between negative 2d and 2d. So p can never be in this region greater than 2d, or in this region less than negative 2d. OK, so this is pd plot, which is a tool for both understanding uh, what goes on in, in the division process. And later we will see also for analyzing the division process and uh, basically how to decide on the quotient digit. So this is what might go into that box. Um, remember here we had the box select the quotient digit which received as inputs four bits each from the two components of the carry save partial remainder. So for example, that box may have a four bit adder inside it that adds those two four bit numbers and gives us a four bit result. So that's the approximate shifted partial remainder, which we call T. And then we only need to look at three bits of T to generate the two signals that indicate what the quotient digit should be. And these are the logic equations for the two signal. The non-zero signal is basically a three input NAND gate. And the sine signal is a two level logic circuit. Okay. an OR gate and an AND gate. So this is a pretty simple combination of logic circuit. So in this case, the quotient digit selection logic is a 4-bit adder. And this simple logic circuit consisting of a 3-input NAND and this 2-gate circuit. Alternatively, I can just not put an adder there or this logic circuit because I have only eight bits on which the decision is based, I can put the 256 entry table inside this box. Eight bits, two to the eight is 256. And then just based on those eight bits, read out an entry of the table that tells me, and an entry of the table will have two bits in it, these two signals. OK, so I can use table lookup for deciding what the next quotient digit should be. Now let's look at the radix 4 division. Now that we learned how to do carry save uh, partial remainder for in binary division, and therefore allowing us to use uh, the approximate value of the partial remainder. So this is a radix 4 division with digit set going from negative 3 to 3. And you see the overlap regions. So for example, when the shifted partial remainder 
goes from 2D to 4D plus 3 is a valid Cauchy digit choice. When it goes from D to 3D plus 2, so there's an overlap in the, in the interval between 2D and 3D when both plus 2 and plus 3 are valid quotient digit choices. Okay? And therefore, I can basically, I don't need to have the shifted partial remainder exactly. If there's some uncertainty here in the value, I can still make the correct choice for the quotient digit. Okay, so this is now the PD plot for radix 4 division. This is actually only one quarter of the PD plot for positive P, for positive shifted partial remainder, and positive divisor. I have to extend this to negative divisors, negative. But the diagram will be symmetric. It will look the same mirror image in each direction. Again, there's an infeasible region because going back to the previous slide, and the shifted partial remainder can never exceed 4D or be less than negative 4D. So anything above 4D is impossible. And then these are the regions where each quotient digit is valid. A 3 is valid from 2D to 4D, 2 is valid from D to 3D, and so on. And 0 is valid from D to negative D on the other side, not shown. So the overlap region between 3 and 2 is this region that I'm highlighting with my cursor. Okay? I cannot put a straight line through that region. So I'm forced to put this line, a staircase-like line, that says I choose 3 above this line, and I choose 2 below this line. And that choice where that threshold is depends on whether D by the way, D, I'm assuming in this example, goes from one half to one. In other words, it's normalized so that the first bit after the radix point is always one. Okay, so it goes from one half to one. So in half of this range, from one half to three quarters, I use this line as my decision threshold, where I choose 3 above this line and 2 below this line. And for the second half, I choose 3 above this line and 2 below this line. And how do I know whether I'm in the first half or the second half? I just look at one bit of D. So the first bit of D is always 1, so I can ignore that. The second bit of D is 0 in this first half, and it's 1 in this second half. So my decision is based on this line if the second bit of D is 0, and is based on this line if the second bit of D is 1. Now for this other overlap region between 0 and 1, it turns out that I can put a straight line through. So the choice here is independent of D. And for this uh, third overlap region between 0 and 1, I can also put a straight line through. And therefore, in these two cases, I don't even need to look at the bit of D. But for in this case, I do need to look. And of course, you know, the decisions circuit should receive this bit as an input because we don't know ahead of time which of these cases will apply. 
So the decision circuit, which in the case of binary, required only few bits of the carry safe partial remainder, in general needs some bits of D as well in higher radiuses. In that example, I showed you only one bit of D needs to be input into the decision process. But as we go to higher radiuses, more and more bits will have to be looked at. OK, so let's say this uh, yellow circle is what I see when I examine this one bit of D. So my D value is this, corresponding to this point. And my P value is this the approximate, so I'm just looking at three bits of P, two whole bits and one fractional bit. I'm ignoring everything else. So based on those three bits, I'm, I'm at this point. This is my D, and this is my approximate P. This is what I call the uncertainty region. Okay, if I look at the first two bits, of D 0 0.10 and not look at the rest of the bits, not at this one and also all the other bits that come afterwards, this is how much uncertainty I have in the value of D. In other words, I see 1, 0, 0 0.10, so it can be 0 0.10, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, a whole bunch of ones that almost takes it to this point. Similarly, when I see point, uh, 0, 0.01.1, 1, this is the uncertainty because if I have a whole bunch of ones after this, the value of this number is almost as large as that one, the next one up. So the actual operating point can be anywhere inside this box. But because of the way I drew this boundary, that entire box is in the region for which three is a correct quotient digit. And therefore, I choose three. So associated with this point is the quotient digit three. OK? Here's another example. If I'm at this point, the purple circle, again, that's the uncertainty region. Okay, I don't know exactly what the value of D is because I looked only at these two bits. And I don't know what the exact value of P is. I looked only at these three bits. But P and D cannot be outside this box. And that box in its entirety is within the region for which two is a valid quotient digit. And therefore, I'm able to choose two. Notice that 1 is not a valid quotient digit because part of this box is inside the region for 1 and part of it is outside. So 1 would not be a correct choice for quotient digit. But 2 is. Okay, now. Similar to high radix multiplication, where we had this problem of the difficult multiple three, three times the multiplicand was not easy to compute, so we had to pre compute it. And we sort of avoided that by doing boots recoding. And so radix four boots recoding avoided the multiple of three. We can do a similar thing here. By restricting the partial remainder, instead of being in the range minus d to d, further restrict it to 2d over 3, negative 2d over 3 to 2d over 3, these two gray lines. And therefore, when I multiply it by 4, it will be in the range negative 8d over 3 to 8d over 3. 
And the nice thing about doing this is that I never have to choose the quotient digit to be plus 3 or minus 3. Okay, plus 2 and minus 2 are adequate. And therefore now I'm developing the quotient with the digit set negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And multiplying these digits by the divisor is always easy. And therefore, I, have, I avoid the difficult multiple 3. But this leads to some complications. Okay, The idea is nice and correct. This is the PD plot in that case. Notice what happened here is that the overlap regions shrunk. In the original diagram here, I had a fairly, I had fairly wide overlap regions and therefore I could afford to have larger uncertainty but within this in inner rectangle the overlap between 1 and 2 is only this much only this much so the overlap region is much narrower and therefore the uncertainty much be smaller must be smaller if I am to make the correct choice for the quotient digit. So this is the PD plot for that division. So radix 4 division with the digit set negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Again, this is just one-fourth of the PD plot for positive P and positive D. Now the overlap regions are so narrow that not only I can't put a straight line through, but I have to put a whole lot of fine stairs to cover that entire span. And therefore, if I want to decide what the quotient digit should be based on the approximate value of uh, P, First of all, I have to look at more bits of D because I have to distinguish between this, this span and this span. And therefore, I have to look. So this span is characterized by 0 0.100, 0, another 0 after that. And this one is 0 0.1001. So I need to look at more bits of D. And also more bits of P, because I have to distinguish basically between this value and this value. And therefore, the three bits that I've shown here are no longer adequate, because three bits can distinguish between this value here and this one. But I have one, two, three values in between those steps. Therefore, I have to add two more bits. So the bottom line is that in order to make the correct quotient digit choice, I need to examine more bits of P and more bits of D to ensure that the correct choice is made. So I avoided that difficult multiple three, but I'm paying for it in terms of a more complicated quotient sele digit selection logic, which involves more input bits and therefore more logic to make the decision. And it's not clear whether this is worthwhile. In other words, what I saved by avoiding the three time, remember that the three times the uh, divisor can be pre-computed in one additional cycle and kept. And once I do that, I can use that simpler radix 4 division process that does not involve these very narrow overlap regions. Okay, this is now this purple box that you see there is the uncertainty region. If I look at the few bits of D and I notice that I'm at this point, Okay, this is how far I can be in the worst case. And if I look at, uh, I guess, five bits of this, because you know these boxes are 
factor of four smaller vertically than the spacing between these lines okay so I need two more bits and this is the uncertainty and this entire box happens to be within the region where two is the correct quotient digit so I can choose two for that Again, notice that I can choose one because this box crosses. So one is valid only up to this line. And part of that box is outside that region. Therefore, one is not a valid quotient digit. So this is now the structure of a high radix, general high radix divider. So the difference with the radix 2 version, I still have the carry save partial remainder. I have the selection logic, which now looks at a few bits of both components of the partial remainder. And a few bits of the divisor. So more logic goes in here because there are more bits of the partial remainder coming in and some bits of the divisor, more inputs, and therefore more complicated logic in here. The quotient digit is selected. Now the quotient digit in high radix can have a wide range. It's no longer just negative 1, 0, and 1. It can be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So when I multiply that digit by the divisor, in general I may get multiple numbers. And then those multiple numbers are added to these two numbers using a carry save adder tree. So remember in radix 2 there was just one number coming so this was just a CSA. But when more than one number come in here then this is a tree of carry save adders. I feed back this. Again I iterate until the last cycle uh, when I add these two numbers. Okay, and I choose as I choose in both binary and high radix, as I choose the quotient digit, I shift it also, it's, that part is not shown here. I shift it into the quotient digit register so that at the end I have the entire quotient determined one digit at a time. Okay, so basically when you do radix R division, you choose a radix, uh, you choose a digit set that goes from negative alpha to positive alpha. So for example, negative 3 to positive 3 in radix 4. Negative 2 to positive 2 in radix 4. You have multiple choices. Then you have to determine the number of bits of E and D to be inspected. And that requires an analysis of the error. Then you have to design the quotient digit selection logic, which can be just a logic circuit or a table. Basically, all of these bits that come in are used as address into a table, and the quotient digit is read out. The multiple generation and selection scheme, this box, must be designed. And finally, the conversion of this redundant. So if this is just carry save, the conversion is addition, but it, it, if it's a different redundant representation, then you need the appropriate converter down there. So this is an example of multiple generation uh, for radix 8 division. So I'm doing radix 8 division, and I've decided to use the digit set negative 6 to 6. Here I have multiple choices. I could have gone with negative 4 to 4, negative 5 to 5, negative 6 to 6, or negative 7 to 7. I've chosen negative 6 to 6. Remember, the more, the wider the range of the redundant, redundant digit set, the wider those overlap regions, and therefore the simpler the quotient digit selection. Okay, so I need the multiples negative 6 to 6 
of the divisor. And I can do this by generating two numbers that collectively represent q minus j times uh, the divisor a. OK? So basically, the negative ones I can handle by simply changing the sign afterwards. So don't worry about negative ones. Uh, so the multiples that I need are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, if I want 0, I choose these two values and forward these two numbers to the addition process. If I want 1, uh, I can choose maybe this 0 and this A, or this 0 and this A, it doesn't matter. If I want 2 A, here is 2a, 2a plus 0, or a plus a. If I want 3a, that's 2a plus a. If I want 4a, oops, 4a, that's 4a on this side and 0 on that side. 5a can be synthesized as 4a plus a. And finally, 6a is 4a plus 2a. So that multiple selection generation logic is just two multiplexers. And uh, the control unit, basically, based on the digit that comes out of the digit selection box, chooses these two control signals here Okay, to indicate which two numbers. And then those two numbers, basically, go here. So I have two numbers in this case. And there are two numbers here. So I need a 4 to 2 reduction. So I can do 4 to 2 counters here to reduce to 2. And then I'm done. So that was just an example. So it's pretty easy usually to design the multiple selection generation logic. Okay, this is a more general theoretical analysis of the Cushion digit selection process for radix R, where the highest redundancy is where I allow digits up to R minus 1 on the positive side and on t up to negative R plus 1 on the negative side. That's the maximum overlap and therefore the easiest Cushion digit selection, but then I will have a lot of difficult multiples to generate among these. I can restrict the range of the Cushion digit to negative alpha to alpha, and therefore the shifted partial remainder to uh, so this is h times d. I limit it to h times d and negative h times d, and therefore r times h times d is the maximum on the positive side, and negative r times h d on this side. And then this ensures that the digit plus alpha is the maximum that I need at the positive side, and negative alpha is the maximum that I need. I leave it up to you to read uh, about the derivations. Turns out that uh, h should be alpha divided by r minus 1. So for example, in radix r, if I choose alpha equal to 2, h becomes 2 thirds, as I showed in, in the previous diagram. So the partial remainder should be between two-thirds of d, negative two-thirds of d, and positive two-thirds of d. OK, there are sometimes trade-offs among how many bits uh, I should look at. So here, I've shown an example of the trade-offs. So these are two points, and these are the uncertainty regions associated with them. In this case, I look at more bits of d. Sorry, 
fewer bits of d so there's more uncertainty there and more bits of p versus more bits of d so less un uncertainty in the d dimension and more uncertainty in the p dimension okay so this choice is not a good one because the uncertainty region is not entirely contained so I can't choose this particular digit value because part of that uncertainty box is outside that and I can't choose this digit value because part of the uncertainty box is outside that whereas this one is okay so the question is how do I decide how many bits of D are needed and how many bits of P what is the best choice what is the optimal choice in order to minimize the total number of bits that I look at in this case the total number of bits are the same so one fewer bit of D one more bit of P versus one more bit of D and one fewer bit of P actually this this box is better if, if it was feasible practical because when I say so many bits of P P has two components you know it's a carry save number and therefore if I have to look let's say at three bits that means actually six bits okay so the trade-off is in favor of this box that has one more bit of D and one fewer bit but of course it doesn't work in this case so that's a false trade-off so the question is how, what how do I go about choosing deciding how many bits I need uh, in order to make this decision correctly so before that uh, this is basically the way this is actually implemented so let's say this is an overlap region and then this is the region where beta so you know this is a generalized view beta is a correct quotient digit and up there beta plus one the next higher digit and I've chosen this staircase as the boundary so anything above the straight staircase beta plus one is the correct choice anything below beta is the correct choice and in this case I had the option of putting the staircase here through this horizontal line or through that one because both of them are contained within the overlap region so that means inside this box I can choose beta or beta plus one so the idea is that I implement a table or a PLA that given the coordinates of these points so from from this point for example this point that I'm highlighting so I'm looking at certain bits of D that puts me here and I'm looking at certain bits of P that put me here and therefore this box is the uncertainty region so the table entry corresponding to this point corresponding to these bits from D and these bits from P will have beta recorded in it whereas the table entry corresponding to this point that I'm now highlighting with this associated uncertainty region will have beta plus one okay so I'm going to skip this theoretical analysis of using PD plots in practice and just tell you that there is a theoretical result a theorem uh, that I proved some years ago that once you have established the lower bounds so the lower bounds on the precision for P are established by the vertical separation of these two lines in other words if there is a certain vertical separation then the uncertainty cannot be larger 
than this box because otherwise the uncertainty will expand into two different non-overlapping region and will cause trouble. Okay, and the uncertainty in D is upper bounded by the this horizontal separation. And once you have those Sorry, I said upper bound, lower bound for precision that you need to look at. The least amount, the least number of bits that you have to look at. So, for example, if this height is one eighth, that means you have to look at least at three bits of p. Okay. So, if this width is one fourth, that means you have to look at least at two bits of d. Okay, now in general, those are not powers of two, so this may be, let's say, one third, this may be one seventh, or some other non power of two number. So they, they give you bounds, which is the next power of two. Okay, so the theorem says once these lower bounds on precision are determined based on delta D and delta P the vertical separation of these two lines which is shown here delta p and the horizontal separation of these two lines which is delta d then one more bit of precision in each direction is always adequate so this what this means is basically you have just four cases to consider. Okay, either those lower bounds are sufficient, you can try those out. If they're not sufficient, then you can add one more bit of precision to D, see if it works out. Then you add one more precision to P, see if it works out. And if neither of those two work out, then adding one more precision to each of them is guaranteed to work. So really, the trial and error case is just three cases. The lower bound, the lower bound plus one for P, for P, the lower bound plus one for D, and then if none of those work out, then lower bound plus one for both P and D are guaranteed to be sufficient. Now, some implementation detail before we end our discussion. One is I mentioned that the PD plot is symmetric about both the d-axis and the p-axis. So the four quadrants are symmetric. However, the Cauchy digit selection choice is not symmetric, despite the diagram being symmetric. So here I've shown, see these two points, A and B, are symmetric. So A has a positive P and a certain value of D. B has a negative P, the negative of that value for P, and the same value of D. So the choice of quotient digit for A is beta plus 1 because the uncertainty rectangle is always to the right and above the point. Similarly here, the uncertainty rectangle is not the mirror image of that rectangle. This one also goes to the right and above. And the correct quotient digit happens to be negative beta here rather than the negative of that. Okay, So this means actually that the entire PD plot should be implemented in order to correctly decide what the quotient digit should be. I can just implement a quarter of it and use symmetry because the choice of the quotient digit is not symmetric, even though the diagram itself. That's because the uncertainties always go in the direction to the right and above, whether or not the values are positive or negative. Okay, so here's a complete PD plot. This happens to come from an old uh, Intel Pentium chip. You see the four quadrants are shown. 
and the staircase like boundaries are shown within the overlap regions. Now there is a fine point here that except for these areas that are circled, the staircase steps can be pretty large. And therefore I need to look at fewer bits of PND to make decisions there. This is an exception. I need to look at more bits of both D because the step size, the step width is one half that and step height is one half that. But then those can be implemented as exceptions in order to reduce the complexity of the quotient digit selection process. I use this common case, these you know wide and tall steps for the bulk of the process and then detect these exceptional cases and have a separate logic circuit to make the decision there. This sort of simplifies the quotient digit selection circuitry because I, I don't have that complexity for cases where I don't need them. Okay, so the quotient digit, uh, this is radix 4, the quotient's going from negative 2 to 2. Uh, D is 1 half, is in 1 half to 1. P goes from negative 8 thirds to 8 thirds. And these are basically up there, the, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so these are the overlap regions. And so in some boxes you see one or two is a valid quotient digit. In some boxes I have the unique choice, one, two, and so on. So I can use those as sort of partial don't cares in simplifying the logic. So you know, and at this point, one or two, either one or two are correct choices, so I have the option, I try one and then the other to see which one leads to a simpler logic circuit. Now I come to the explanation of the Pentium division bug, one of the most celebrated hardware bugs in the history of computer hardware design. So Pentium when it was designed had this floating point division bug that went undetected during the extensive testing and also for a while after it was actually shipped and people started using them. And it's an interesting story that there are references at the end of the chapter about, you know, what happened, how the bug was discovered. Basically the bug related to this diagram. So let me explain what it was. So those red lines that you see show the uncertainty region is above those red lines. In other words, values of D and P that put us in that region does not occur, okay? Because that's 8 thirds of D. That line is 8 thirds of D and P can never be greater than 8 thirds of D. Okay, so the design uh, system, that automatic design system that optimized the tables for this division, decided to remove table entries corresponding to all the points that lie in that region in order to simplify the table hardware. And when the table is simplified, of course, it can become faster too. A smaller table tends to be faster. So this point here, for example, is in the infeasible region. So the automatic hardware design system removed that. I don't need a table entry for that, and so on. All the points, however, some of those points are really 
infeasible like the green points that you see here because the entire uncertainty region is outside the valid bounds and therefore we should never encounter that particular point in the division process. On the other hand, these red points, they are also in the infeasible region. However, their uncertainty boxes actually do have points that could be encountered in an actual division. So this point, for example, and for this point, this point. Now those are very rare events. That's why you know the problem went undetected during testing and during uh, months of use until somebody who was doing heavy mathematics in connection with number theory actually encountered divisions that fell into those problematic regions and saw that the divide unit is misbehaving, is not giving the correct. So these entries that are removed from the table cause us to, when, when we encounter a division in one of these areas that are actually feasible, and the quotient digit should be two, the quotient digit zero is generated because a non-existent table entry, the way hardware was implemented, gives you zero. You look up the table and it gives you zero, whereas it should have given you two for this point. Okay. Now, once you make this mistake of putting two and uh, putting zero instead of two, it's never possible to recover from that error because even if all the digits after this zero are chosen to be two, the number is still not big enough to make up for that two being replaced by zero. Okay, so division is basically, this is a good example to show that division is really a more difficult operation, more error prone operation than multiplication because the only notable example of a hardware bug that caused a lot of problems, caused problems for users of Pentium, early users of Pentium, it caused problems for Intel because it lost many millions of dollars by having to replace all these uh, defective Pentium chips. Okay, so this is complicated enough for a big company like Intel with many uh, dozens of engineers working on each of the products it uh, releases, actually missing this subtle bug. And then it took a lot of uh, explanations by mathematicians. Uh, several papers were written right after this bug was discovered to try to explain what had happened. And some of those papers are listed at the end of the chapter as my references. It's interesting to see both what happened, how it was discovered, and also how it was explained, you know, why this error existed and why it did not show up very frequently. You had to have some very specific division operands for the bug to show up. Okay, so that's all I want to say for about high radix division. And uh, next time, uh, we'll cover chapter 15, variations and dividers. And then after that, we have another chapter on division, uh, convergence division. Okay, uh, bye for now until the next lecture.